and everything. So that's what I'm doing. However, I um, made sure to um, attend those classes I could attend. And the ones I could not attend go through the slides. Fast forward to today, um, I went back to, um, to go through a slide about CV um, and applying for internships. And guess what? I was able to apply what was taught in that um, lecture. And I was successfully picked into the tier one law firms to intern. Olanua Ajayi decides. I am here to assure you that the place you are in right now, you are being set on a trajectory for a very great career. So please make the most of it. I was also privileged to also um, speak on the Twitter space on blockchain technology. And that was um, hosted by um, Mrs. Deborah Oni. So I really, again, I've said it as has been said before, please just be committed. And if you're not able to attend any session, be sure to look back at the slides that, was, that will be sent and recap on things that have been taught. I'll be handing over now to the moderator for today's session. Thank you. Deborah, are you still on call? We can't hear you. Um, ma. I believe she's having issues with her audio.
I believe she's having issues with her audio. Ma, are you there? I'm sorry, okay. everyone. Okay. okay. Uh, great. Yes, ma. Okay. I, I, yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Even me myself was also having network issues, so I understand. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, you're all welcome to day two of the Hilton Top Solicitors Virtual Female Internship and Mentorship Program. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm sure a lot of you are as well. Thank you all for taking out the time to be here, and I welcome you, and I hope that your, all your expectations will be met. I want you to know that a lot of us are working hard on this and um, you will do yourself good and us as well if you show up with the right attitude. And I promise you, if you show up with the right attitude, you will, get, you will gain a lot from this program. So I'm very happy to see that a lot of our participants are here. I know we're more than this, but at least majority of our participants are here today and i'm sure our pioneer is very happy to have you all here as well so thank you once again for taking out the time to be here i'm sure you all have your pen and paper ready because today is the beginning of our lecture series and today our pioneer herself is going to be teaching you on blockchain technology our topic today is introduction to blockchain and its role in the digital economy Yesterday was an onboarding session, and I was very happy to see amazing feedbacks from all of you, most of you, uh, on our WhatsApp group. And also on LinkedIn, I saw some of you made a post on LinkedIn, and I, I really appreciate it. That's very good, because yesterday, one of the things we learned um, is to be confident. And um, going, putting yourself out there, that's a show of confidence. And I want to encourage all of you I want you all to know that you know more than you think you know, and you can do more than you think you can do. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Don't be shy. And uh, as you continue to do that, I'm sure you will learn, you will grow. You being here means you are willing to learn and um, all your labor will surely be rewarded. So today I have the great privilege to introduce to you our speaker for today. She's our pioneer, Mrs. Deborah Enyone Oni is a legal practitioner with over a decade post-call experience. She's the founding slash managing partner of Hilton Top Solicitors, a tech savvy law firm committed to delivering legal services through innovation and technology. She is the convener of the Hilton Top Solicitors Female Virtual Internships and Mentorship Program for law undergraduates and graduates. She's the founder of Hilton Top Emerging Tech Academy. Mrs. Deborah is an emerging tech lawyer, blockchain researcher, educator, and consultant, a smart contract research fellow, a mother of three girls, and a tech empowerment advocate. She has a test for innovation, and at the core of her strength is her ability to adopt a new type of thinking and use cutting edge legal technologies to help clients solve complex issues in a technologically emerged world. She's the head of the blockchain and other emerging technologies unit of the firm. Her interest in the emerging technology space has led her into acquiring various reputable certifications in saying she's highly focused, resolute, confident, dedicated, and a committed personality. She holds a Bachelor of Laws LLB from the University of Jos, Plateau State, and had a BL from the Nigerian Law School Abuja, and was subsequently called to the Nigerian Bar in 2010. She has a master's degree in law from the University of Lagos, Akuka, Lagos. She regularly advises a broad range of clients, including local and international companies, on various sector specific legal issues such as joint ventures, regulatory compliance, general corporate advisory on the Nigerian law and policy affecting the incorporation and operation of businesses to help clients maximize opportunities and profit in their businesses and minimize risks. 
She sits in the board of reputable companies as the legal secretary and advisor. She is the program coordinator slash administrator of Cryptography Development Initiative of Nigeria. She is an ambassador of the Global Policy House. She's a public speaker and she's often called upon to speak at local and international seminars, webinars, and conferences. She's a digital content writer and has authored several articles majorly covering blockchain and law and artificial intelligence. She's passionate about sustainable legal practice through innovation and technology, women and girls, and their inclusion and participation in the Web3 space. She partners with organizations that foster the development and growth of women and girls in the digital economy to achieve a greater result. She's a mentor to young women and female law students across various universities in Nigeria, law graduates and lawyers, and her passion for women and girls has led her to pioneering women-focused programs such as Hilton Top Solicitor's Female Virtual Internship Slash Mentorship Program which has educated about 2,000 women since inception in 2020 on blockchain and cryptocurrency. She seeks to build women and girls with tech skills so as to be digitally aware and thus empower to participate in digital economy and other aspects as well. She uses her legal expertise to support the development of women. Let's give a round of applause to our speaker for today. As you can see, she is an erudite scholar in the field of blockchain, and she is an authority in blockchain technology. And from what we heard yesterday, actually, blockchain technology was what got her interested in technology law. So she has a lot to impact to you today. So I encourage you all to listen attentively. Don't be distracted. Uh, take notes, because some of the notes that you take and some of the um, lectures that you have we we'll actually give you an inspiration on how to do your personal assignments. So take notes. Perhaps today, some of you might already get an idea on what you want to write for your personal assignments. So let us welcome Mrs. Deborah Oni, our pioneer and our speaker for today. And sit tight as she takes over. Yeah, welcome, Ma. Very well, thank you so much. Uh, just give me a minute, let me share my slide. Thank you so much, uh, Grace, for that warm welcome and that great introduction. Thank you, Deborah, also, and thank you to every one of you as a volunteer team. I know we have uh, Ayola here, we have uh, Grace, we have uh, Deborah. Thank you all. And thank you to the amazing ladies of the HTSF VIM, the Hilton Top Solicitors Female Virtual Internship and Mentorship Program, the eighth cohort. Thank you to you all. Thank you for being here. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of this professional journey of yours and to be able to impact the, the, the knowledge all the little that we know on uh you know upon you and then um i'm really grateful for this opportunity to be presenting on the topic blockchain and like grace rightly said this was the major technology that got me into the tech space and uh, it's, a, it's a, an aspect that i'm so passionate about all right ladies uh, without wasting much of our time i uh, will just swing into action and uh, i believe you can see my slide please kindly confirm on the chat box if you can see my slide if it's visible to you please let me know okay all right very well thank you all right so you already know my name and this is me um okay this is a bit about me uh as read out by deborah uh, by grace rather um so our topic for today introduction to blockchain and its role in the digital economy i can't see what is written we can't see we can see now okay can you see what is written now i can see the slide now okay very well okay thank you all right 
Okay. So uh, the feedback is that you can see. So if you're having issues with seeing, uh, probably you might want to check your device, right? But uh, keep me on the track should you don't hear from me again or you're not seeing this slide clearly. All right, introduction to blockchain and its role in the digital economy. So could you do me a favor if you have heard about blockchain before? Please just type yes, yes, yes in the chat box. And then if you would want to share a knowledge with us on what you really understand about blockchain. Yes, thank you, Bolu Atife. You've heard about blockchain. And uh, yes, uh, Agnes. Um, yeah, okay. Wisdom, thank you. Yes, Winifred, you've heard about blockchain. Could one of you, uh, Motolani, yes, thank you. Ngozi, yes, okay, thank you. Wow, so that's great, of course. Uh, it will interest you to know that there are those who have actually not heard about the blockchain, right? So if you have heard about it, no, oh, seriously, yeah, Cecilia ha haven't heard about it. So we are glad you are here today because now you have heard about it. You're not just hearing about it. You're going to get introduced into it because the truth of the matter is that we cannot finish everything about any topic on this platform. Don't forget the purpose I told you yesterday is to, you know, give you that introduction, let you know how this connects with you and how it intersects with law and why you should be interested in any particular area, whether in the blockchain space, the artificial intelligence space, or the product management, data analytics, uh, intellectual property, and every other thing that you will be learning on this platform. I did tell you that every session that you'll be having here, I personally selected those topics and broke down the areas that should be explored in alignment with what I know or not think that it will actually help to guide you on this journey towards your participation in the digital economy, right? Okay, thank you, Agnes. It's a database that keeps transaction record. Great. Yes. Yeah, blockchain is a type of decentralized digital ledger used to record transactions and other data in a secured way. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you all. I know that if I should wait for every one of you, you will have definition, right? Yes. And uh, Akimbade, it's a decentralized, secure, and transparent digital ledger that records transactions. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So we move swiftly. You have all said well. But, you know, it's so easy because, like I said, we are in the age of information overload. And uh, sometimes it's not the lack of information that we're suffering from, but the fact that there is too much information that can actually get us confused. And at the end of the day, we don't know how to, uh, we don't know the road to actually follow. You know, if you're going on a particular road and you definitely, you somehow don't know the address you're going to, and you get to a particular area, probably supposed to be the landmark. And then you see different roads, thousands or hundreds or tens of roads, all, you know, leading away from that landmark, you will be so confused. But if you have only one or two or have someone who has given you the direction already, it does not matter whether those the streets that move uh, away from the landmark where you have gotten to, whether they are in thousands, you already have the direction. You already have that specificity in terms of uh, the specific road where you should take among these thousands. Because probably the person has been there or the person is the owner of the house where you are going to. But if you are to go by yourself and say, okay, I saw something on online and this is the address they told me. And there's no map that actually directs and you are to go by yourself. You'll probably be confused and then probably take so much time. Or you could actually have the definition in your mind or, you know, chat GPT or any other AI could actually generate results or uh, the definition for you. And it could actually, you could have the the definition in terms of, you know, having to cram or probably, you know, you don't have to cram, but you probably just read through and you understood. But really how to connect it with reality, you have no idea. Most of the things we are here to do is to help you, you know, get that kind of direction whereby you are able to actually, you know, relate some of these teachings and some of these topics and see how it comes down home to you for you to now be interested and conduct further research on it. 
So at the end of this session, of course, I'll be giving like a, maybe an assignment to be given and be, you know, disseminated on the platform after now, right? And then uh, we'll be having a Twitter space to deal with the topic on blockchain also. Usually we hold that uh, Twitter space we did on uh, during the last edition also. So quickly into the definition, you're all right. Blockchain, okay, the table of contents, most of the things will be running through apart from the one on the table of contents. I have others, uh, you know, uh, inserted into it. So we'll be going into the introduction and then talk about what blockchain is, the major blockchain technologies, the types of blockchain, the advantages of blockchain, the challenges of blockchain, whether in the legal space or generally, right? And then, of course, the role of blockchain in this digital economy. How does the blockchain... Uh, uh, what role does it play in this digitized world that we we are now? And then what are the legal and regulatory uh, implications? And then, of course, the opportunities. How does it concern you and I as legal professionals? The opportunities that are there and how you can actually play a role in the space. And then, of course, uh, we'll look at some of the uh, future trends, right? And then, uh, of course, we'll conclude with that. So um, the definition of blockchain so you have given it already. And so I'll just run through that again. Blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized distributed ledger that records transactions. It records transactions and it records it in an efficient way and in a way that is verifiable and in a robust manner. Then another thing or another features, because the thing is we define this blockchain by the features that it has. Another feature that we can use to define blockchain is that the blockchain is a timestamp chain of immutable records managed by a cluster of computers and not owned by any single entity. Now, let me break it down. When we say a peer-to-peer -peer network, the blockchain is peer-to-peer -peer and is decentralized. Transactions that happen on a platform of blockchain because a blockchain is not a property you can carry. A group of some researchers, some scientists, in, uh, 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 some years back, came together and looked for a way to put some computational calculations together and bring about a very secured platform whereby people can actually do transactions or record information in a way that it will be time stamped, meaning in a way that it will, be, it, it will not be subject to tampering by people. Now, let's take a typical example. On this platform, what we do is to leverage technology, right? So, and um, like I tell people, if you are in the blockchain space or any of the emerging tech space, especially the blockchain space, there's no way you will not understand the existing improved technology because it will help you. You have to understand that and leverage that improved existing technologies for you to have like a working knowledge of what the blockchain actually means. Now you make use of Google Form, you make use of Google Sheets for most of the, the, the things that you have to do on this platform. Now take an example like the compilation of the list of the instance, those who are active and those who are available on the WhatsApp platform that we are, we are collating by sharing the link of the Google form. By the time we download the CSV file or the Excel file, now if you have downloaded any of the, uh, the reports or the results of a Google uh, form that you shared with some persons to fill a form and you probably get to the response area and you have to download the results. If you download, you're going to see a part where it is written timestamped and then you have every other heading. You have the serial number, you have every other heading that you, every other question that you inserted in that form. Now, I want to pick the issue of the timestamp because the Google Sheet is not on the blockchain technology. For that timestamp, now for every one of you that filled, the minute you filled, the moment you filled that form was recorded against your name. The time that you, re you recorded. Now, so if I need to trace anything, probably the, there was a timeline that was given and some other persons say, oh no, I, I actually, we're now arguing about as to who filled before the other person. Now we will go, we will see the time within which Deborah first signed and then the time within which Grace signed into that uh, platform and then the next person, right? But because it is a normal digital platform and not on the blockchain, which is immutable, 
The timestamp is there, but it's not timestamped in the sense that it will be timestamped to be secured that will help to uh, have a level of security in terms of the immutability of the blockchain. So what I have discovered from that result is that you can actually click on that timestamp and you can change it. It can get deleted. And then you put another time. That is for the normal traditional digital entry. But assuming that this Google Sheet has been deployed or was created on the blockchain technology, do you know what will happen? The timestamp that applies to every name, every entry, because that's a transaction. You fill the form for us to collate the names of the particip uh, participants who are active and are ready to actually follow through with this program, right? So for the ones that are deployed on the blockchain, anything that is written in terms, in terms of the timestamp will be the real thing and you will not be able to change it. Why? Because of the feature of the immutability of the blockchain that you are seeing on the screen here. Why? Because anything you deploy to the blockchain, it will be secured because it's not easy for you to erase. It's not easy for you to change. Now, when you deploy an information to the blockchain technology, don't forget we're saying it's, it's basically a, a digital ledger. It's a database whereby the transactions are entered in a way that is secured, it's efficient, it's immutable, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized platform. These all make the features and the advantages of the blockchain, and I'm trying to explain it even, uh, for you to get so that timestamp nature of the blockchain will not allow anybody to tamper with it. So now when we have to determine the first in time in terms of ownership of a property or bring an example into the intellectual property world where probably somebody has come in, uh, come out with an invention and maybe uh, in the traditional system, as a result of some of the, uh, the long processes that he has to go through, probably he, he wasn't able to meet up to register that patent against his name quickly. And another person was probably building the same thing. And at the same time, by the time he finished, he was able to quickly get it registered. Now, the thing is that if we're talking about digitization, the digital system, it's going to make things easy that even the first person who was able to come up with this invention will be able to make entry as to the ownership and the fact that he is the person, the first in time who created this invention. And once he has entered that information on the blockchain, nobody can tamper with it. Unlike the traditional system whereby probably you can even register it first, but because of some of the gimmicks and the fraud and the scams that go around some of the uh, parastatals where all these things are done, you could have a tampering with that information. It does happen very well in the land registry. So even the timestamp in the traditional system cannot be compared because the blockchain works by virtue of the immutability that you cannot change it. So if it is saying that this entry was made by Debra as at 12 p.m. today, you can't come and change it and say you want to change it to 4 p.m. so that it will appear that Debra came in late and then another person came in earlier. So what is registered against it in terms of the timestamp at the point of that entry is what will show. So that's the issue of the timestamp. So while if, when we have timestamp, even for traditional improved existing technologies, as simple as the Google Sheets that you use, where I said, if you are downloading your response concerning a form that you have sent out for people to fill, you will see that timestamp there. That will show when each and individual filled in that form but it is something that is subject to change because it's still the traditional digital system that has been improved in a way, but not deployed to the blockchain. So the blockchain, by virtue of that immutability, will help to guarantee the timestamp of any information that is entered into it. And so the peer-to-peer -peer nature of the blockchain is the fact that the transaction happens between a large number of persons distributed across different platforms, across different jurisdictions. They don't have to be in the same place. Now, traditionally, if you have any information, take an example, uh, this, uh, you have a document that you have put into a system and you have the central server. Uh, let's use the example of the bank. 
sometimes you go to the bank and they have to confirm or do any transactions. Uh, you have to go to the customer service. Sometimes you stay longer than necessary because they'll be telling you that the server, the main server where they are supposed to, they are supposed to access the information is having an issue. And God help them, if that main server should collapse, then they could probably lose that information. Yes, you could say, oh, don't they have backup? But anything could happen to the backup also. Recently, uh, my husband had an, uh, an issue with one of the hardware, a backup uh, hardware where he stored some information over the years. And he just discovered that, uh, I don't know whether it's a virus, but all the information have been wiped out. So these are some of the issues that you have with some uh, uh, of these traditional devices and technology or modes of entry data or storing information or storing transactions. But the blockchain is here to help decentralize the information in the sense that once this information or this transaction is performed on the blockchain, you are not just the person that have the information. There are, there are peer to peer networks because the blockchain does not work with only one person. Only you cannot sit and say, oh, I'm, I'm performing a transaction on the blockchain. It happens within a distributed network of persons. So it is this network, the connected nodes, N-O-D-E-S, that's connected computers. There will be several co computers that are connected and not they don't have to be in the same office or the same place, in different jurisdictions, in the sense that the information will be maintained differently by each of these connected nodes, each of these connected computers. So your own is independent of the one that Deborah has. The information will be the same, but whatever happens to your own on your system does not affect the one that Deborah has. And anytime you are able to log onto that blockchain platform, you will still access that information. Why? Because it is distributed. It is decentralized. It doesn't work in a way that is centralized and it has to be like, oh, this information, everything we've been working on has been with Deb Rowney, and now the system has collapsed, God forbid, right? And so we can't access it again. No, as long as you are a part of that blockchain network where the transaction was conducted, you will have yours, everyone will have. And so if you like, go and roast and burn your system, the information will stay there. Why? Because information or transactions all records entered into the blockchain platform are stored in a way that, like we said, it's immutable. You can't go and change it. And because it's decentralized, you are not the central authority. It's not, it doesn't have a single point of failure. So if your system fails, you are not the central authority. Everyone has a copy of that transaction because it is distributed across multiple jurisdictions. And as a result of that, because it happens within peer-to-peer -peer that are connected with their computers, with their nodes across different jurisdictions, you can actually verify. Why? Because the process of entering information into the blockchain platform, there are, there are the things that make up the implementation or the transactions on the blockchain. So you don't just come and say, oh, I, I, I've heard that blockchain is good, so I want to deploy this information into the, black, uh, the platform. It doesn't just work that way. So now the connected network, the connected computers, everyone that is serving as a miner concerning that transaction will have to verify. And that brings us to things like some of the technologies of the blockchain where we have the consensus mechanism. Now, they have a consensus uh, algorithm whereby the various connected computers will have to actually verify the transaction before it is deployed to the blockchain. So if they, call, um, if, they, if they verify it and know that it is actually emanating this information or this transaction is emanating from the right source, then they agree. These persons, don't, don't, don't forget that these persons don't have to know themselves because they are not relying on themselves, but they are relying on the blockchain. And why? Because the blockchain makes use of a, an algorithm, the, cryptogra uh, the cryptographic algorithm, which is an advanced form of coding. So the information that is deployed on this platform is, is, is uh, deployed after being coded into this advanced form of coding, which is called the cryptographic algorithm. And then it is now deployed after it has passed through the process 
through which the miners will have to vet by verifying that this thing is actually emanating from the right uh, source. Now, we have a lot of, uh, you know, like some technical aspect of it where they will talk about the computation, the calculation that they have to do and come up with uh, this, uh, the, the hash that the the network of persons will have to agree upon before they deploy. But of course, we cannot bug you with that one here. If, if not, you get confused. Before you get into the technicalities, if you should, or if you must, or if you want, it will only come up from when you have to understand. But you do not have to get into the technicalities. Because uh, uh, in the first place, most people feel that blockchain is all about the technicalities and probably that's kind of you know uh, way different from the uh, from law. But it's not. So there are various aspects. There is what we call the blockchain ecosystem. So you do not have to be the developer. You don't have to be part of the miners. Even you are sufficient and more than enough, even as a lawyer, because you bring a lot to the table. We'll get to that aspect. So what, in, uh, in essence, we've been trying to explain the blockchain, what it is, by not just reading out what we have and what we find on the various di digital platforms, on Google, on ChatGPT, and on every other aspect, but I'm trying to break it down for you to uh, get to understand. So another example that will probably be so easy for you to understand is, let's use the land registry, which is one of uh, uh, the first use case that actually came to my mind. The first day I sat under a blockchain seminar, it was a physical seminar. The first day I heard from my mentor, why not look into the blockchain space? I had to follow my husband to go for a blockchain seminar that particular year and when i was hearing about the explanation because the thing is they were just uh, talking about the blockchain generally so i didn't even know how it relates so i was going to hear what it was all about apart from the fact that i've been hearing it in my house about the cryptocurrency aspect whereby we were already uh, my husband was already deeply into it so i needed to understand the blockchain with which parts this cryptocurrency so as a result i said we'll make use of the land registry for easy uh understanding you know, in the land registry, there's a lot of data entry that happens, right? And my experience with the land registry over the past few, uh, past few years is the fact that a lot of gimmicks do happen within the land registry, whereby uh, the documents, title documents are swapped for, and uh, uh, somebody's title documents are swapped for another, or another is sitting in the house and thinking that he has a title upon a property and the, uh, and a different thing is happening around that property, especially in Lagos where we are. And I'm talking from uh, 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 several experiences that I've had for my clients, right? So um, in this particular uh, episode of an example I will use, a particular allergy was to dispose the property to my client. And he was in custody of a particular uh of this deed of uh of his of his CFO. And then this CFO has a different name. The allergy's name was not on it. Now, uh, when we I will come back to the fact that okay, blockchain, why we say it is blockchain is a block. You can also use uh, this technical aspect to say it's a block of information that are stringed together by the cryptographic algorithm, right? So once there is a break in any of the chains that are connected, you the the connected nodes, don't forget that I said the connected nodes in the blockchain parlance, the nodes are the computers. The connected nodes will be triggered to know that somebody is trying to, you know, scam the system or try to take away an information or push in an inf information that is not emanating from the right source. So back to the allergies case. He has a title document that has no connection to him. And then my clients, as it usually happens in Nigeria, they will go, uh, you know, uh, they will go do the transactions by themselves at the point of making payment. That's when they will just remember that a lawyer was supposed to actually be carried along and they'll probably tell you to review these documents. And he sent the, and she sent the document for me to review. It was at that point of review that we noticed that there was a break in the chain of title. Reading through the document that the other uh, lawyer had drafted, we already, we knew that the, from the reciter, we knew that there were some gimmicks that were going on on that document. So at the end of the day, we were to have a meeting. And when I got there, he called his lawyer, who he, that's the allergy, who was in the age range of the allergy. And what we discovered in the long run, I will spare you too much of the story, was the fact that it was either the allergy or whoever within his network 
worked in the land registry at a particular time years back because the deed of the CFO dated back to like 1970 something. And uh, because and because that document was so old, in fact, the owner, of course, was dead and the property was somewhere around Yaba. And so they had already convinced my client. And I said, if he cannot trace his title, there was no deed of assignment that actually connects the fact that maybe the previous owner sold to him and he was probably not able to perfect his title or anything. So there was no document that actually connects him to that original title document. And so I raised the alarm to my client and she didn't go ahead to buy. But the analogy was angry be because he felt that I was asking too much questions. Now, how does that relate to the blockchain? Don't forget that I said it's like a string of, uh, of blocks, uh, a, uh, a block that are stringed together by this cryptographic algorithm. That's the language which the information are being, you know, written in the blockchain, right? So now for this information, these tiny little blocks that have one block will contain information about a particular transaction. So in this landed properties in the in the real estate space in the land registry case that we're talking about now so take an example that the first person who owns it let me use the names of those on the platform here so let's assume that grace is the owner of this property initially now on the blockchain we'll have the first block that will be drawn i'm not sure you can see but let's draw like a tiny box and put the information about that land in the first box in the blockchain that's that's the, the uh, Genesis block, telling us everything we need to know about that particular land. I'm still using that land as an example, right? And so that Genesis block will tell us everything we have to know. And it has been deployed to the blockchain. Now, because it's been deployed to the blockchain, we don't have to trust a third party or a human being. My client was going to trust the allergy until I came in as a third party to review and to alert her, right? Now, the trust will now be taken to the cryptographic algorithm where you know that it is not subject to human manipulation. So the first information, which is the first Genesis, the Genesis block, telling us that Grace is the owner of that property, now will be linked by way of cryptographic algorithm to another block that will tell us another transaction that happens on that land should Grace wants to sell to Debra. So now if Grace now sells to Debra, it will now be linked to it, right? And so when Grace, before it will be linked and that information as to the transaction that happened with Debra will be deployed to the blockchain. It will have to be verified by the group of people, the network, the people we call the miners, to know that this information is actually emanating from Grace, who is forming the, the Genesis block. And it's not like we carried Grace and put on the blockchain, no. We only imputed the information about the property. And in fact, with that, you at some point, when you maybe probably enroll at some point for any of the master classes or bootcamp, to understand aspects around tokenization, digitizing real life assets and stuff like that, right? So now it is the information about that property, the title documents and everything that will help us to verify the fact that Grace is the owner that is in the first block, which is the Genesis block. Every other block has to find its roots, its authority from the first block. So now the miners will have to verify that Grace is the one who is transferring this property to Debra. And so once they have verified by way of doing all the uh, calculations, and then they have been able to vet and verify. And in this case, I would say, there will be an aspect for lawyers to also play a role. Because in terms of the property, lawyers are always, what is the work that we usually do? You help to conduct some due diligence to help them cross the T's and the, uh, dot the I's, just like in the aspect of what I did by trying to you know, conduct some search in the land registry. From there, I was able to you know, know that, okay, Alaji has no connection to the original owner of the CFO. So now they don't have to come and meet me physically. So I could be as legal professionals for the aspect of smart contracts and everything that deals with these transactions as legal professionals. You could serve as the miners that will verify. So when we talk about computational uh, calculations and the rest of it, now in terms of, 
it's not like there are some people who are doing some mathematics and all that as it relates. So those who have the knowledge that are in the aspect of the finance in terms of the cryptocurrencies, they act as those miners and verify the transactions to know that if it is a crypto transaction, that this person who wants to transfer five bitcoins actually has that five bitcoin and that he or she is the owner of that bitcoin that is trying to transfer. So in this case of the land, what we're now saying is that, okay, so me as a lawyer, you as a lawyer, that you are now, because you are in the space, the ecosystem of the blockchain, you, your role will be deployed to the digit, uh, digitized system. Don't forget that it will all, everything will be automated. So by virtue of block, uh, the smart contract, which is the automated contract, the agreement that will be automated and will be self-executory. Because they won't need me and you to be there again. But why? Because while we're talking about the fact that blockchain will eliminate uh, in, intermediaries when we come to the fit, uh, features, that's for an intermediary, anybody who is a professional or who is playing the role of an intermediary and does not understand this emerging technology. In the long run, when the uh, when we get to you know great and mass adoption of the uh, of the of the technology, the people who do not have that understanding will be dispensed with, especially if you are in the role of an intermediary. So in this case, you help to now conduct that verification or the authority that needs to be given for any of this information to be deployed to that blockchain. And so if you're if you are if if they are able to now verify this, they will now agree the connected node. So in this case, for the lawyers who will now act as the minors in this case, because they will need some legal uh, assistance to be able to verify all these uh, things, for you to be able to know whether it is valid, for you to review the documents, read through, and you know, uh, cross the uh, the T's and dot the I's, and know whether there's a break in the chain of title, be able to highlight anything around the smart contract and whatever needs to be done before this information will be deployed to the blockchain. So if it passes through the process, and of course, like I said, it's not just one person before they will say the person manipulated. That's why we say it's decentralized, the peer-to-peer -peer network. It has to be within a different person, right? So if you are the one transacting with another person, it's not something you transact on your own or by yourself. That you say only one person you are sitting in your house and it's just you unless yes it's done digitally but it's, there will be other connected computers connected nodes that are doing the transactions so once they come to an agreement by way of that consensus algorithm whichever uh applies who who's whoever among the miners that the information is agreed that this is the right information then they agree and then deploy it and string it to the genesis block so block chain the block so that are changed together the block of information of data so the number of information you can put in the first block is small right so you cannot come and say you want to when grace is transferring it to debra that you come and in, include that information on the first block the genesis block you know if you have access to that one you probably want to tamper with it again and say no it was not even grace that owns it anymore it's debra that originally owned but you won't be because once that information is put together, it will be locked in it, and the next information will be stringed to it. It's not like you throw the information somewhere else. Just like or, or opposite to the traditional system, whereby you can actually enter information, throw it anywhere, enter it into any other platform, and at some point you're trying to collate the information. There's no proper audit trail, and you are wondering which of the information came before the other. In this case, that next information, you don't throw it off or, or beside or in the middle, it follows by that cryptographic algorithm and forms the next. So it's a chain of blocks that will be moving and going. So when Deborah now decides that, oh, she wants to sell or give some part of it to her children, that information also, the network, the connected network, the connected nodes, the connected computers within that network will be triggered also that the transaction is being uh, facilitated by somebody. They now have to verify that it is Debra who is trying, that this transaction is emanating from Debra. And so when they now know that she is the one and they are able to vet everything, don't forget the process of the fact that miners will have to verify this information. So that, that, those are, these are the things that make the blockchain very secure. And in a way, making it, when they say the blockchain is trustless, meaning it takes the trust from humans. 
prior to this time in your financial transactions, in your landed properties transactions, of course, we're still dealing with that. It's not like the whole system or industry have been transitioned or, or fully revolutionized to start leveraging. But these are the great potentials and various organizations are already building and leveraging it. That you have not seen does not mean it's not happening. In various jurisdictions, some are already leveraging it. In land marriage, they are already, they have, you know, deployed their land registry onto the blockchain. So now they will verify to pass through the same process. And once it is verified that this information is coming from the right source and the necessary things are put together, they deploy it, it gets strings to the next block. So this one will be linked to the previous block, which is the Debra zone. And Debra zone was linked to the Genesis block. So that is how it will keep going. And so there is, what are you seeing? That there's proper audit trail. There is traceability. Do you know how many cases of land are in the, in, in, in the court? Some, you will hear the number of years those cases have been. And you are wondering. Because this is one of the major issues that is actually, wherever you have things about data entry, you have to enter information about transactions, whether it's about uh, your finance or it's about your property and the, anything that you have to enter information prior to this time or even at present, we are having issues with data entry. The fact that we have a lot of scammers, we have a lot of bad actors in the system, whether in government, parastatals, in private organizations who are working to actually mix up the information and defraud innocent persons of their hard-earned money or of their property. Like we said, it happened with the case in the land registry that I was talking about. Why? Because the system of information or data entry there prior to this time was done analog. So you have to do it in the traditional way where they are doing things probably on paper and the next thing somebody can just tear the paper, the paper could just wear out and you don't have the proper information before they are doing the uh, whatever they will have to do. They are able to swap documents for each other or they are able to go into the system even when it's been digitized. They, they, they of course, uh, getting to the blockchain platform first starts with digitization before you deploy it to the blockchain because you have to collate all the information possible, put it on the digital space before you deploy it to the platform, the blockchain platform that is secure, right? So if they're even digitizing like we have Lagos digitizing the process, it's a first step towards the right direction. But it's not the end in itself to just stop there because on the traditional way of data entry, it can actually be changed. It can be cleaned. It can be erased. Another example I will give was a client of mine at some point was going to sell, uh, uh, was going to buy a property. And when we went to the land registry to conduct the search, we saw that the documents he presented us with, yes, it's been on that property since 1991, but we saw, uh, and he, he, of course, the owner is a doctor, somewhere in Amuwo, um, not, um, yes, in Festac, somewhere in Festac at Raji Rasaki. So the person wanted to sell the property because the, that particular street was becoming commercialized. And uh, it was a residential property he built there. He's a doctor, practicing medical doctor, and quite elderly. Not knowing that while he was sitting there over the years and had, had he has big structures on that property that he, he lives there, that another person's name was reflecting in the land registry at Alausa concerning that property, a woman for that matter. He's not even a man because uh, when we got there, by the time I heard the name, from the results of the search, I said, no, this can't be. Because if it were to be a man, first, I might deceive myself and probably feel that, oh, maybe that is other name that they and they lost me. It was another person called Boston that was the owner. I had to even alert him because uh, obviously myself and my clients could not go ahead to buy that property until he sought out that issue. Prior to that time, he told us, of course, he was not able to perfect his title. And I asked, so we were going to get into agreement whether we hold on for him to perfect the title before we buy or we help to facilitate by paying him some money to be able to quickly perfect his title before he disposes it to us, as in pay him some amount out of what we agree. 
and only to conduct this search and we saw that it was not his name that was in the land registry. Now we understand that that property is part of the federal scheme uh, property and some, some things were done around it. I think there was a time they were doing some level of regularization. Different things were going on, on the, in the land registry and some persons within the system, they felt that they could actually change hands. They had no idea that a human being was even living on it. And um, by the time he came into it, he said, no wonder that he's been trying severally to perfect his title. And each time his document gets to a particular table, they will, they will tell him that it was already missing. And they will tell that there was a time he engaged a lawyer to do it for him. It's the same thing the lawyer faced. They will get to a stage, the lawyer will say they told him that the file is missing. They have to start from the beginning. I've also had my own fair share of uh, frustrations in terms of helping clients to perfect titles in time past. So at that same time, what are we seeing happening here? Because the method of the record entry is not, is not secured. That's why you can see that people can just defraud. This is what this man has been on since uh, he's been on that property. He bought it. He has all his documents in terms of how he bought it, the receipts, the deed of assignment from the original owner and everything. The only thing was the fact that he has not gotten the consent. Because each time he tries, to get the consent to perfect his title, it, it gets swallowed in the registry there. Because we the system of data entry, of entering the transactions on that property is not a secured system. So it gave room and is giving room to a lot of bad actors within the system. So now what will this do? In the long run, if these things are not, are not uh, tackled because you might be wondering so what how does that really concern me all this story we are talking about data entry uh transaction entry for it to be secured now take an example like i said the man has been on that property under the notion that he is the owner of the property which truly he was the owner because he started taking up the matter it got to a bigger level of course i had to find another place uh, for my clients and all that now if he were to be there and probably maybe he retired only to wake up one day and some persons are coming with the document don't forget that those ones if we had not quickly spotted that and alerted him about it probably if we had not made the intention because we approached him that wanted to buy that property because it was close to another uh plot that my client had gotten and so he wanted to collapse everything together and make it a big supermarket for the uh wife and so if we had not alerted him and he sat there for so long and probably retires from the medic medical practice when he will feel oh let my soul rest let me just enjoy the house i have built he has big structures there and one day somebody wakes up and comes to his house with title documents telling him that he is the owner and takes him up on a legal battle do you know that could actually cost him some heart aches and even lead to some high level of hypertension that could actually lead to heart attack and that would be loss of life that's for you to know the importance of record keeping so the, the lack of proper records, did you see where it's leading to? That somebody will lose his money and not just money. If you have committed a lot, a lot of your effort, he has committed his money over the years of medical practice to buy a property and he was able to develop and only to hear that at the end of the day, because he was not able to, now that takes us to timestamp also. You know, the first in time. So he was the first in time, but every effort to make uh, due his uh, position or to regularize his position or to perfect his site was being frustrated by the system. And as a result, another person will come with the documents and say, okay, you, you've been there. Yes, you've been in possession and the rest of it. But for people like that, that will want to come up with those documents, they would have put a lot of evil structures and strategies in place to frustrate him out of that property. And if he's not able to hold it, he would probably die. Or he would probably have died. So that's the level to which we are saying the implication of having the right uh, uh, secured platform where informations, whether about people's finances, about the transactions of their properties or their health information or everything that deals with record entry will be secured. It is very, very important. So much so in the digitized world where everything is going to be, almost everything is going to be automated. Because don't forget, we are in a digitized economy. An economy that is interconnected and that you can operate 
across your own jurisdiction and beyond the cubic that you have as an office and beyond what you can ever imagine. So we are connected. And so the more every business, every transactions we do are digitized, automated, the more there is a need to have a level of security and a level and take away a level of a monopoly from the hands of the few. And so the purpose of the blockchain was to actually bring about decentralization. So I hope with this example, we've been able to have some level of understanding about the blockchain. So now for the, um, thank you. All right. So for, okay, that's the, okay. Thank you, Joy. Yes. So I hope you understand that if you have any explanation, because I will want you, the thing is that you need to understand the basic. If not, every other thing will be confusing you. So that's why I've been going into these examples. And then, okay, let me give you this final simple example. Take an example that this book, is a blockchain but of course you know that you can't hold the blockchain the blockchain is not something you can carry and hold right mm -hmm. so now assuming without considering that this is the blockchain right you see this first page this first page is the first block let's say this is the first page of the information where you have to enter everything about uh race that i was talking about concerning that landed property Yes, it's it's more like securing people's data. Yes, and not just uh yes uh, data your uh, okay yeah your data in terms of your finances your properties and all that. So that take that takes you back to that definition again. Let me recap for you that the blockchain is a peer to peer decentralized distributed ledger that records what that records transactions efficiently. So those transactions could be data of course in a way that is verifiable. So you have the group of the miners that will verify it. And it's not like somebody will just bring any information, whether it's right or not, they just bring it to the, black, uh, to the platform. No. And it is time-stamped. So it will, uh, it will uh, and then of course it's immutable, right? So this first information here, once you enter that uh, data, let's use the book analogy. So the next information or transaction that comes, the entry will go to the next page. Now, let's assume that this is not the normal book that you know, so that any page, any information you have entered into this page, unlike the traditional data entry, whereby you can actually, you know, uh, tear off this information. On the blockchain, you can't tear it off. You can't tear it off. And unlike the traditional system of entry, whereby this book I'm the owner, I'm just showing you here, you don't have access to it. If it were the blockchain, if I deploy this information here, as I'm talking to you, you'll be seeing that information. Yes, on the digital system, I'm sharing this, you are seeing now, right? But I could decide to actually edit and remove this first whole thing that I put here. And the next thing you say, well, where is the definition of the blockchain she put? I have deleted it because I can, because it's from the central uh, server, it's from me. I'm the one controlling the information that you're seeing on the slide now. But if it was deployed on the blockchain, even if I make a mistake, by the time I will have to do, it's not something I can just go and erase and put. So if I make a mistake, that one is gone because we have to rewrite the process. We have to rewrite those codes again. And trust me, it is not easy. It's not simple. It's not cheap to rewrite the codes and deploy to the blockchain. So that's why the issue of the immutability can actually work as an advantage and also work as a, as a disadvantage because while it works to help secure the platform in the sense that nobody can go and change the information. So all the persons that are changing information from somebody's name to another uh, person's name on the title documents in the land registry, or go and take the title documents and delete the information about it and put, the, put what they want, or feel that because it's long time ago, 19 or 17 something, probably nobody will trace it again because it was done manually at that time. If it were to be the blockchain, doesn't matter the number of years, it will be traceable. It will be traceable. And so these blocks that are linking to each other. So in the, the blockchain, I have drawn this block saying that they are stringed together, right? So this book will not be, this first page will be the first block. So unlike you having to flip to the second page, it will just be stringed to it and forming a long record of data entry right and in the uh unlike the traditional system where you can now delete from the system or you can now tear off you cannot and the information you put on it 
will be visible to every participating node in that network. And as a result, you cannot just run and go and change any information by yourself. Okay, uh, imagine I can see you raise your hand. Uh, uh, okay, do you, if you have any question, could we put that? Okay, Catherine, can you please jot your questions and then we can take it at the end of the session. We're pressed for time, right? Because we didn't even start early. Okay, um, Deborah, is that okay? Or do you think we can accommodate some questions in between? Okay, can information or transactions be deleted? No, it cannot. That's what we are saying. And that brings us to the features of the blockchain. It's immutable, it's decentralized. So that immutability is what I've been trying to explain. I said the fact that this book, take it that it's a blockchain and that it's not the normal book that you and I know that you can share. Any information I put in it, I cannot go and use this pen and cover it and say, I want to paint the word so you won't see again or I want to erase it with erasers so that you don't see again. No. While you can do it, the thing is that the process of changing information, of altering information on the blockchain is so hard and very expensive to implement. That makes it not to be able to alter easily. So as a result, it brings about that immutability, which brings about the security of the blockchain. So that when information is deployed to the blockchain, that's why people can actually trust. They won't have problems to trust you. They're not trusting you directly, but because their trust is now placed on a cryptographic algorithm, which is able to, uh, to guarantee the fact that this thing cannot be subject to manipulations and it cannot be subject to uh, quick erasure or altering or tampering by anyone. So once that information is deployed on it, it's time stamp. The time it was deployed will be there. No one will be able to come and delete. So information about the first owner of that property, who is Brit, will still be there because it's time stamped. And because you cannot come and delete, unlike the Excel sheet where you filled your name that I can actually delete and remove the, the time and actually enter another time if it was a dubious person that was dealing with it and probably time is of essence or an issue in the collation of that result. And the person will enter all that information. That's for the traditional digital system of entry for that Excel sheet that I made an example of. But if it was deployed on the blockchain and you have that Excel on the blockchain, you won't be able to change it. Because why? Like I said, you will not be able to quickly alter information. The process of altering information means that the codes are rewritten. Don't forget that the, there's an advanced level of code that the, the information are deployed on the blockchain. So it makes use of this cryptographic algorithm, which is an advanced level of coding. So the information will be uh, will be encrypted and deployed on the blockchain and the process of writing those codes are not cheap and easy to alter so that's why i told you also that as much as that immutability of the blockchain works as an advantage it, all, it also works as a disadvantage because if there is an error then you have to rewrite you have to re you know restructure that solution again you have to rewrite that code again so you have to rewrite that smart contract again and it's not cheap, it's not easy. So that's why it is very, very important, even when they are deploying uh, uh, any information, any smart contract onto the uh, onto the blockchain, of course, uh, you, they have to be very careful. There's a need for review. There's a need to check out that the, the, the necessary clauses are inserted and that there's no error. Because at the early stage of the blockchain, there's what we call the DAO attack, which is a 51% attack. This, the, the, some group of persons were defrauded of their ETA. ETA is the is a coin of the Ethereum, which we also call Ethereum. Ethereum is actually the platform. As you have Bitcoin, which doubles as uh, the Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain technology, and also doubles as uh, the, the coin. So this uh, group of persons, of course, uh, lost their ether to some bad actors, to a scammer who was able to exploit the vulnerability in the blockchain platform and siphon the ether of some persons. And do you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, because there was an issue with the smart contract, because what it was traced to was because there was a vulnerability, there was a loophole in the smart contract. So that even brings the importance of a lawyer because if you are able to review that contract before you it was deployed to the blockchain and became the smart contract, you will know some of the you know the provisions about the uh, legality, the 
validity, the enforceability, and everything that is necessary to put a contract in place. And while reviewing, just like I review that document for the client, just like the normal traditional rule. And so when people are looking at and they say, oh, the, somebody is trying to drive me away from the normal law, I want to practice, they are taking me to the blockchain and all that. These things are taking over. And the thing is that it is the role that you perform traditionally that you are still deploying, it's being automated. That's just what makes the difference. Because you will review these documents, you will be able to know the right clauses that are supposed to be imputed. If you are such a person that you love to be technical about it, you can go forward to even learn the smart contract program, but you don't have to. You don't have to. So if you review that, if you review that, okay, the, the case of the DAO attack or the 51% attack is a popular uh, case of the the ether that was siphoned during the early stage of the uh, Bitcoin of the blockchain uh, technology for the cryptocurrency case. So DAO attack or 51% attack. So your role as a legal per, uh, uh, professional is found in most of these things, right? So let's uh, move forward. Uh, if you have other questions, I'm sure we will be able to tackle them uh, when we get to the Q&A, we'll press for time. And so we have uh, the blockchain platforms or blockchain technologies, some of the platforms that enable blockchain use cases. So we have a Bitcoin. So now originally we know that the first use case of the blockchain is was the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency. And so the blockchain is a platform, the technology that powers the cryptocurrency. So now what brought about the Bitcoin was the fact that there was a need to now bring about decentralization of the financial system. They saw that, okay, uh, the money and power is being concentrated in some few, you know, your traditional banking system and the financial system, whereby whatever the bank tells you, even up till now, we still go through that, right? Sometimes you go to the bank. I've heard people complain. They get to the bank because I hardly do physical transactions, right? <laughs> but maybe when there is a need, when it's very, very important. Uh, so you go to the bank and then um, you are told, uh, my auntie has told me at some point she needed some uh, large amounts of money. She got to the bank. They told her it was not available. So this issue of the fact that you have money now, but some persons are telling you when you can have it and when you cannot have it. And it has been from time past. So we know that uh, there was a great level of monopoly in the financial system. You have no idea how much you have there. They can charge whatever they want to charge. When you get there, whatever you see is what you see. And then when you can have access to it. So everything was just happening. And some group of persons decided that there's a need to actually decentralize and have a, a, a financial platform or system whereby people can actually have access and control to their money. You work for this money, so you should have a say in it. You should be able to move your money and see the money when you want to see it, move it when you want to move it in a very safe, secured, fast, efficient, transparent way. And so the issue of the cryptocurrency, uh, which Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, there was now the need to build a platform through which this Bitcoin will be transacted on that is secured. That was why I was taking my time so long to explain what the blockchain is, talking about what it means, security, to be able to explain what it means in terms of uh, the security, the Im uh, immutability, how that actually translates and uh, the implication of that to the real life. Because I know that as we move forward, you will probably be getting it easier, right? So there was now a need to build a platform through which this money that you'll be having access to and be able to dictate what you want to do with it in a very fast, secured, efficient, immutable way, there will be a need to have a secured platform that will guarantee that, uh, that, that will guarantee your, your funds, right? So that it will not be accessed by anyone and they will tamper with your records or tamper with your information. So the transaction could be information about your data, your health, uh, your health history, your financial history, or the your finance the portfolio or your property so this the first one like i said the bitcoin was in the financial aspect which is a cryptocurrency and that the first cryptocurrency was the bitcoin and it was even because of this that the blockchain came to be that there's a need to build a platform whereby this cryptocurrency will be transacted in a secured manner and so they had to build the blockchain Right. So a platform that will now guarantees the security of this transaction, a platform that is timestamped 
and makes the information that is there immutable. And so someone cannot just gain access to it and go and change the information for you. A platform that is fast for you to deal in terms of the transactions you want to carry on. So the Bitcoin was the first one. So Bitcoin, we have Bitcoin as now. So the Bitcoin you see on the slide now, I'm talking of Bitcoin as a platform, as a technology of the blockchain. And of course, the Bitcoin is also acting as the coin through which you use to transact on the, on the uh, Bitcoin technology or on any other technology within the blockchain space, right? So then we have the Ethereum. These are blockchain technologies or blockchain platforms that enable you to be able to build other solutions. Now for the Bitcoin, it was majorly focused on the cryptocurrency, the financial aspect. So as a result of some of the loopholes that the Bitcoin has uh, had as a then, as a result of things like uh, scalability, when there's large amount of transactions it becomes like slow but the potential of the bitcoin is the of the blockchain is the fact that it is fast right but we've not reached and achieved that yet but that's of course the uh the the possibility the potential so the bit the ethereum was an advancement over the bitcoin oh sorry you were not hearing me at some point sorry so it's an advancement. So the Ethereum came to be able to solve some of the problems that Bitcoin had. So Ethereum now enabled smart contracts. So it is through the smart contract that when we come to the case of the use cases of the blockchain, the smart contract actually enabled the building and the creation creation and the development of various use cases that actually relate to real life just like in the financial sector they saw the issue of uh, uh, of um centralization and they needed to bring a platform that would decentralize and take the power from just a few persons who own the bank and were controlling the money so there was an issue that they knew that the blockchain would be a solution to and they created it and so for and it was strictly on in the financial system and so the ethereum now came with a system whereby it enabled smart contracts and other real life solutions could actually be built. So it's not just about, oh, the financial aspect, cryptocurrencies. If you're not building cryptocurrencies, you cannot use the uh, Bitcoin. So no, the Ethereum was now able to enable use cases whereby people can tokenize real life assets. So that's why we can even talk about the real estate, whereby you can actually build a solution on the blockchain uh, platform, whereby the data entry, the transaction entry can actually be secured on that platform this is enabled by the smart contract which is a solution to help tackle some of the loopholes or the gaps of the bitcoin and so of course the issue of building uh dabs decentralized applications like uh, uh, uh the various um like binance like um which other one do you know the decentralized if you know some of the decentralized applications please uh name them here so we have several several decentralized applications and then we have a centralized one. So the Ethereum actually enabled that. Enabled the building of those decentralized applications. So now, of course, we have Hyperledger also as one of the blockchain technologies, right? So, yes. Okay, so Flair. All right, thank you. So Hyperledger also. Hyperledger is a collaborative open source project that is hosted by the Linux Foundation. And so it, it, it enables the ecosystem developers to be able to build real life cases, right? You can customize it for various industries, build real life uh, solutions on that platform. It's open source, meaning if you are a developer, if you have an idea on how to build, you can just, you know, you will get there, you'll be able to gain access to that open source uh, project and be able to build a solution. And one of the ways you can get involved in this, like um, for the uh, Hyperledger, Hyperledger has a Google, um, I said Google Meet. They have a Meetup uh, platform. We will have Hyperledger Nigeria. Uh, I mean, the, I'm with Cryptography Deve uh, Development Initiative in Nigeria. And the president of the Cryptography Development Initiative in Nigeria is uh, uh, someone known to me. And of course, uh, um, on the platform of the CDIN, which is the cryptographic 
uh, the, uh, development initiative of Nigeria, we were able to, you know, get some access to like the hyperledger. I'm able to understand better about hyperledger because on their community also, we also act on the CDI and also act as one of the partners to be able to, you know, uh, organize programs and things like that on the hyperledger Nigeria chapter because they have various chapters for different countries, right? So what I noticed because sometimes I also share uh, their meetings and their uh, webinars they have a lot of ecosystem uh, members or partners that are building great real life uh, solutions on the platform and they usually create or organize webinars to educate about those things and when you join sometimes i join some of them get so technical i don't run away i still stay there because the thing is that the blockchain is not something someone can just open your mind you have to be committed to continuous learning if not, you will just end up just cramming stories about it and you don't really know how it comes down home to you or how it really finds, you know, expression to real life uh, situations in your life or how you can open your mind to learning more and be able to be a partaker in the ecosystem to build solutions that will actually tackle most of the real life problems that we have, whether in the legal space or in the world at large. For me, from that very first day that I sat under that blockchain space, I already detected from my from the time, because this was uh, uh, from the time that uh, I I have been practicing, I have the, uh, the I have uh, detected the issue with the land registry, and even in the litigation uh, aspect in terms of some of the pro bono matters that I took up and were not able to find the details of uh, a particular inmate that we took up the matter from uh, Kiri Kiri. They were, quite, they were like uh, five in, in this particular case. And we got to the high court in Ikeja. And they, of course, we discovered that this inmate has been in court for like, was it like nine years? The only time he appeared in court was at the point of arraignment, right? And so we took up this matter. We got to the, uh, the court registry to be able to dig out the file and all that. The information was not found. Now the re the methods we're all talking about data entry, talking about uh, you know uh, entry of uh, data in a secured manner. At the time that he went to the prison, the information was on the paper, right? And by the time we saw the suit number of on the register, the register was looking so tattered. By the time we got to the one that was close to him, the one where his own information was supposed to be found was torn out because that register was so worn out. And these are some of the things that happened. So as a result of that, you can see that that will lead to a delay of dispensing justice. It could actually lead to, at the end of the day, maybe a loss of life. There are great implications with the wrong modes of data entry or the lack of security. How is the most relevant relationship between blockchain and Loma? Okay. So these are some of the issues. So some of these things that you are seeing, uh, from the uh, legal space, like I said, in terms of the record keeping in the uh, in the legal space. Now we're talking about record keeping. I have used an example in terms of the land registry, even record keeping in the court, right? So um, the blockchain technology will address all questions at the end, right? So we have a new, so we quickly have to run through. Uh, we have EOS, we have CODA, we have Quorum. Uh, Forum, of course, was uh, it's uh, a privately uh, developed one by JP Morgan Chase, right? It's uh, a consortium uh, blockchain. Like when we get to the types of blockchain, we have the public, private uh, blockchain, hybrid uh, blockchain, which actually combines the features of the public with the private. And then we have the consortium one, whereby maybe a group of organizations that uh, transact within the same industry will probably have a need to be able to gain access to some information and maybe they build a blockchain platform whereby they can actually grant themselves maybe some level of access or APIs to be able to gain information. Take an example, like uh, we know that forum, like I said, JP Morgan Chase. So within the banking uh, uh, system, now if you probably want to transact or you have transferred some money from First Bank to GT Bank and you're having an issue. So if probably you are in your First Bank and they need to confirm and get an information from the GT Bank, maybe by way of the fact that they have organized themselves as a consortium to build a consortium uh, blockchain, they can actually grant themselves some access to some forms of information to ease 
their transactions and the seamless operations within that particular industry. That's the consumption on. So the private one is uh, maybe an organization just, uh, you know, they decide to build a blockchain tailored to their own need. So in that case, some of the features of the blockchain will not be found in that private one because things about decentralization and permissionless will not be uh, will not be tackled in the private one because uh, the blockchain is supposed to be decentralized and it's permissionless, but in private blockchain, because the organization is building it for themselves to be because they probably have one of the features of the blockchain that it can actually work out well for them in that organization. They build it and only group of persons that they authenticate or authorize will gain access to that uh, blockchain for that private organization. But ordinarily, the public blockchain is the main blockchain that, you know, is permissionless. For the private, is permissioned. You need to have permission to be able to access. And then, of course, for the hybrid, the hybrid combines the features of the private and public. So while the public is decentralized, nobody is a central authority about it. The private is centralized. And so that still does not reflect the full nature of features of the blockchain, which is supposed to be decentralized and permissionless. But for the hybrid, it will combine both. So maybe an organization or a government parastatal will probably build, take an example like maybe the e Naira that was built. The e Naira was built uh, on the Hyperledger. So that's a blockchain, right? So maybe it's for some features at, at the time when you probably transact and we send uh, e Naira to other platforms, there will be features that are just restricted to most of the CBN staff members, right? And then there are other uh, uh, public um uh, interface that we can actually interact with, right? So they will combine the public and the private together to form the hybrid form of a blockchain. And then, of course, like I said, the public blockchain is the main one, all this Bitcoin that you see, nobody actually owns it as a central authority. You don't need permission to join the network. So if you know what to do, you know how to code and all that, you just join the, the open source and you are able to build a project on the platform of the Ethereum, Hyperledger, and every other thing, all the Bitcoin if you're building within the financial aspect in terms of the cryptocurrency, right? Okay. All right. So we go advantages. I've also I've, I've mentioned the advantages, the features, um, the advantages. There's no centralized authority. There's greater transparency. There's high security and faster dealings. All this I have tackled in the explanations that have been given. So uh, there's, no, uh, there's no centralization. So which is what I was talking about. The key advantages is the issue of decentralization, transparency, scalability, security. I know not scalability, rather, uh, security, and then faster dealings, efficiency, and then, uh, of course, traceability. Uh, the fact that the blockchain enables things like uh, you tracing a particular product to know the the place where the information or the product is coming from. So there's a great, if you remember the example I gave you in terms of that uh, landed property or uh, the land registry we're talking about, the string of uh, the blocks that are stringed together. So be, because it's stringed together and it's entered in a way that is verifiable, you are able to trace. It gives you this proper audit trail whereby you can actually say, oh, this is the first information in time. This is the one that follows. This is the next one and all that. And if it's in the health sector, of course, you are able to, also trace to know where the original uh, uh, information about your health, the, the first entry, what it was, the improvement you've made or how the health of that patient has deteriorated and should that client or patient has to go across uh, that jurisdiction, they could actually have uh, access to the information and be able to trace the health history of that patient. We've had different cases whereby some uh, patients were administered drugs that were not good to their health as a result of the fact that they were probably diag diagnosed in some other jurisdiction and probably they are not so uh, educated and they have no idea. And then they get to a particular hospital. If you remember, some doctors will ask you, oh, do you have ulcer? Do you have this? And probably you're not aware because the doctor has entered that information uh, without telling them. And then, of course, this particular doctor in another place where you have probably relocated has no information to that uh to trace your history that could actually that has led to several loss of lives in other aspects uh in some cases that one has read uh, right and then of course it's 
helps with that traceability in terms of some of the the count, uh, counterfeited drugs that are you know uh taken to various jurisdictions. That's why we have now that working to be able to fish out some of the uh the fake drugs right and then of course drug, uh, products that are also counterfeit whether edible or in any aspect that they are so if you are able to trace uh, because if it's on the blockchain you are able to have that audit through you are able to trace by uh, the uh, chain of supply where this product is coming from and if where the product is purposing sometimes some products like in the health sector some of these drugs will be purposing to come from the right source but not knowing that it was uh, it, it's not actually coming from where it's purposing to come from and at the end of the day people use them and then they die people eat some products thinking that this is the product from this particular place where they know that they can trust that this is a genuine uh, product, a genuine uh, wheat or a genuine uh, anything that's edible. And you probably, you are so careful to know that, oh, you don't just eat uh, anyhow. And then the next thing the person is telling you oh, is this particular one that you are looking for, that's the product. And then you eat it and it now happens that the one that is not good for your health is the one you have eaten because you were not able to trace that information. So trace the supply chain through which that uh, product came. Or what about your designers? Most times uh, for, uh, when you want to buy designers products, sometimes people are buying counterfeit even more than the original. Especially if you're in Nigeria, you have some group of persons who have put themselves together and they can actually imitate this whole thing and just copy the, the whole design and do it like it's the original. When you start using, you get to know that, oh, it's not the original. But whereas you have lost a lot of money because you actually thought that probably this is uh, the particular designer that you wanted to buy and you paid heavily for it, not knowing that that's not what you actually uh, paid for. So, but by the time it's on the blockchain information about it, you can actually scan that food and it will just bring out every information about that product or that food or that drug and you are able to trace. So it gives you that proper audit trail to be able to trace the, orig uh, the, uh, the origin of a particular product and then of course increase efficiency because the whole thing is automated, you are able to have a great efficiency in terms of uh, operation of business and uh everything that you have to transact on. Then there's increased trust. Now, like I said earlier, the trust is not on the human being because don't forget that one of the advantages of the blockchain is the fact that it, it brings about this intermediation. So it removes the intermediary. And in most cases, lawyers are playing intermediary roles. So the blockchain wants to remove intermediary because the intermediary are part of the things that makes transactions to be costly. So because you have to intermediate between party A who wants to sell a property and the other party who wants to buy or because you have to intermediate be between uh, 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 a, a person who probably wants to uh, conduct a business and the other person who wants to sell, uh, the person who wants to sell and the person who wants to buy maybe a business or merge, right? So the thing is that once these things are deployed on the blockchain, everything is automated. The smart contract is there once they are satisfied with the information and everything is verified and uh, the, whole, the whole due diligence is conducted in the automated system, then they can actually go ahead and transact and conduct their transactions without having uh, to have recourse to a third party who will make the process to be longer and who will make it to be cost, to be more costly right so uh but of course this, there's no fear because if you act as an intermediary as uh, as we do as legal professionals the fact that you understand this technology and you are in the ecosystem uh, you will now be able to that role you are performing but not performing it traditionally physic, uh, in the physical way but you will be your role will be deployed to the automated uh, platform and then you will be performing that service there to act as those that will verify this uh, the, the authenticity of that business and uh, the measures that is going uh, on or the uh, the sale of the property that is going on or whatever you need to do to help verify or conduct any form of due diligence or perform or perform your role as a lawyer, right? So at the end of the day, the thing is that it's just taking you from the traditional mode of practice to a digitized, automated, efficient way of practice. And it's only when you are in that space that you will be able to understand because if you just sit where technology is in terms of just leveraging existing improved technology and you have no idea about this very important technology, the blockchain, because it is predicted to be the major driver in the digital 
whole economy. So that's why it's very important that you get to know the uh, blockchain. So whether you are going uh, in the aspect of the cybersecurity, data privacy, intellectual property, and every aspect, the thing is that blockchain is one of the main driver of the digital economy, and it's uh, it's an emerging technology that you want to understand and then know the various evolution that has come around it, the various uh, uh, innovations that are coming around it and has come up to this moment. Because, of course, we haven't really scratched the surface so much yet. And so we are, we are likely to see more of the adoption and more of the usage in terms of enterprise blockchain. Those are other aspects of blockchain, whereby the, the, the governments will be adopting this blockchain to be able to, you know, uh, things like voting and some other forms of services that will be ad adopted for the enterprise blockchain. So at that time, there will be a need for, for legal practitioners because that's where we are moving to. So when government is now saying that there's a need to maintain the security of its information in terms of maybe the national defense system, they're probably looking for how to build real life solutions to be able to bring about security of information in terms of uh, conducting uh, elections. They're looking for how to build uh, great solutions on the blockchain. The thing is the legal aspect will definitely be the roles that you need to perform. So if you understand things around the smartphone, right, you don't have to overwhelm yourself to say, oh, I, I do not have an idea about it yet, no. But just get to understand the blockchain, get to start committing to learn and even read whether the free one and commit to train even whether for the paid master classes for the free classes that you see like being here that's a great thing for you because you get to understand the basics like this and then you are able to follow through because by the time we are getting to the uh, large adoption in terms of even getting to the level of beyond private organizations to the government by then the legal personnel or legal professionals who are in the ecosystem already who already aligning themselves like uh like we are doing here right now will now be this uh, these are the sought to uh the sought after lawyers that will be actually participating in that space at the time right and so even yes you you can say oh i can do a catch up at every time like i said if this is predicted to be the major driver in the digital economy and has every other thing connected to it, uh, whether you are talking about the cyber security, we're talking about the data uh, privacy, because everything we're talking about on the blockchain is a digitized system. So before you, uh, there are other emerging technology. We have the AI, we have the IOC. There are things you should look out for. Of course, we have quantum computing, which we have not scratched yet and is coming. Uh, we have the president of the CDIN who will also come to speak to us on quantum computing. We know some of the threats that are coming from the cybersecurity space that will probably break some of the uh, the uh, cryptographic algorithm that the present blockchain is using. But you have to get uh, know and understand what is even existing now before you are talking about the one that is threatening the present uh, cryptographic language of uh, the blockchain, right? And of course, the government is interested in it of every jurisdiction. Uh, so it's better and it is very important that you get interested also. So you want to look at things like national blockchain policy to know where the direction of your country is going. That's for Nigeria, where it is going. And then, of course, like I said, we're in a digitized, interconnected world. So it is very, very important that you get to understand this. We've spoken about the features of the blockchain earlier. Some of the challenges of the blockchain, I've spoken about the types, uh, the, uh, the issue of integration with existing technology. So these are some of the challenges how the blockchain is not presently able to integrate seamlessly with the existing technology. But of course, improvements are being made and I'm sure uh, a few places they are already able to see these issues and these uh, challenges and are trying to build uh, for a seamless integration with the existing technology. And then, of course, some of the challenges that we could say, which I would term as part of the legal challenges here, we have the general challenges and the legal challenges are issues around the smart contract. Now, uh, if uh, you as a lawyer, uh, you are in the ecosystem of the blockchain, when they have to deploy this smart contract, like I said earlier, you will have to be able to help them review this smart contract. Coming from a legal background, you will use your legal mind and your legal eyes to be able to know and suggest and advise and consult for them on the right things that needs to be put on this smart contract. So some of the issues that it also poses are the fact that, okay, in this smart contract, who is now responsible? The issue will now be, okay, is it the lawyer that reviewed the document? <laughs> or is it the 
the person who actually owns the blockchain uh, platform and things like that. So, so those kind of challenges could come up. But a major challenges are the fact that if these uh, smart contracts are not uh, well put in place, it could actually lead to a lot of loss, like we have in the DAO attack or the 51% attack, right? But already we have uh, people uh, uh, people building expertise within the smart contract. We have smart contract auditors. Now there are a lot of uh, industry standards that have been put in place that is even inquiring that developers should have understanding of what it takes to be able to uh, put the smart contract in place and the standard that the smart contract needs to actually meet up with before they deploy it to the blockchain. So it's high time we try to, you know, get to understand some of these legal challenges that this technology poses and every other technology, right? And then, of course, there will be issues as to who will be liable for that blockchain platform. Then, of course, already we're having issues around the governing laws because we know that the blockchain like we said, what we are used to in the, in the traditional system is a centralized system of operation, right? So the blockchain is a, is a, is a technology that came with its own self-imposed rules and norms. It is decentralized. That's quite alien to what we have in most of the systems, most of the jurisdictions. And so adapting the existing laws, which was tailored to centralized systems, has always and have been posing a lot of issues and th those were one of some of the reasons that actually led to bad actors leveraging the fact that there was no uh, standard or setting laws that could cater for it and probably you know cut away with the uh, funds or properties of innocent persons, right? So issues around governing laws also in terms of, we know that we're talking about the fact that it's decentralized, it's distributed, distributed across various jurisdictions. And so as a result of that, you probably will be wondering, okay, at what point if there's a transaction that has happened and there's an issue or there's a legal liability, you're going to have to determine which governing laws is going to actually apply to this. These are things around the legal space right so i'm sure from this you're already catching what your role will be right so of course in terms of the intellectual property so because there will be a lot of because there will be a lot of uh, transactions businesses uh being automated because you are not talking if you talk about blockchain you're not talking about traditional system of operation you're talking about a digitized and even advanced level of digitization right so because these various solutions that will be coming on the digital platform on an automated platform will also need protection of the owners of the various softwares of the various applications of the various solutions and so this is where your role will come to be also you can act as advisors and then get, uh, be able to also help to uh, lead in terms of registering and helping your client to be able to protect their their solutions or the solutions or the products that they have built in the blockchain space. So uh, the traditional role that you perform is not something that is outside that you say, okay, uh, how can I, can I join technology with law? Yes, this is it. This is law we are talking about. This is technology we are talking about. People are building inno innovative solutions, uh, tech solutions, and they need to protect it. The need for intellectual property protection has never been as much as it is now because this is bringing about new business models, is encouraging and fostering innovations and solutions building. There's a break in the bar uh, in barrier to entry to business. And so even younger persons are, are making, are creating more solutions than we have ever known before. So because of that, the, because of the eruption in the number of new solutions that are coming up, there will be a need for you to also help with their protection of uh, intellectual property. So all well and good. So you are in this space when you get to understand those who build solutions on the blockchain technology want to know what the existing laws are talking about and what are the peculiarities of the blockchain solutions that they have built and then of course that brings us to the issue of when we understand all these loopholes we are able to come together as an ecosystem of women in the emerging tech space to canvas for policies and you know uh, come about formulation of policies that will actually help to foster and not siphon innovations right that's our role but if we stay at the back and feel that this technology does not concern us at the end of the day what we will see is the fact that uh, it, uh, the big force the big companies would have built great legal solutions, which they need not be lawyers to come up with uh, legal solutions, right? So they will build those solutions to cater for the issues, the challenges that these emerging technologies are coming up with. And then you as a lawyer will probably cease 
because you don't want to align yourself and you are so used to the traditional mode of practice. And at the end of the day, we'll now be at the mercy of those who have gone ahead to be able to take the large chunks, right? So we don't want that. So issues around privacy compliance, right? It's one of the things you do. So in terms of privacy, we're talking about, okay, you want to know your clients, where are they operating? Is it, is it within the EU jurisdiction? If it's within the EU jurisdiction, you want to make sure that the solution and whatever they are building and whatever they are doing in terms of the transaction within the blockchain actually complies with the data protection regulations, the EU GDPR. And then of course, it is the Within Nigeria, the NDPR, the NDPA, you want to ensure that they are complying with the provisions of the data protection uh, protection regulations, right? So if you are now, this is if you are not seeing it already, that's why I said if you are taking up any emerging role in the digital economy, it is very, very important that you get to understand the blockchain because everything is covered from there. Because from the blockchain, you also know that because everything will be digitized and we are having high level of automation, we'll be dealing with threats also. So the issue of cyber security. Security comes into play, uh, play there also, right? So you want to ensure that you are helping in that role. Even, of course, in terms of cyber security, and then for cyber security, we have someone also take us, and uh, a cyber security professional take us on it. So for the cyber security, we know that because we are deploying businesses and uh, there's a lot of disruption and everything is being automated, there will be a larger level of threats in the digital space. And we want to see how we can safeguard our data. We want to have to see how we can safeguard our businesses, infrastructure, systems that are being deployed to the uh, digital space. So bringing about a safe cyber uh, space. And then because of that, you want to understand what is the peculiar nature of the blockchain. And there's some of the issues and the threats that comes within the blockchain space or the digital space that we see. There are issues around like cyber uh, insider threats that may be part of the developers within the space or also will put some loopholes so that they can actually exploit that one at the end of the day and, you know, uh, can people or probably uh, do away with uh, people's uh, information and do and deal with it in an unauthorized way, right? So you want to help with compliance issues within uh, cyber, uh, within uh, privacy and even cyber security. And so for we as lawyers to coming into the cyber security space, I know one, uh, one of the fastest things we can, uh, the greatest place we can be in terms of helping with the compliance is the GRC, governance, risk and compliance, right? And then of course, some of the challenges we have in the space is limited scalability also. Uh, I did say also that uh, it, Bitcoin had the initial uh, then, was of course the blockchain really is not getting to a level that is so scalable yet. The fact that when there's large amount of transaction, it, it tends to slow down, right? So uh, we are likely to see more or increased scalability in the coming years. Uh, yes, I know we've gone quite fast. So let me just run through this. So uh, the role of blockchain in the digital space, in terms of cryptocurrency, the uh, blockchain is the one guaranteeing the security of the cryptocurrency. I have explained all that earlier. So it's the technology that underpins cryptocurrency. So it brings about security. Then in smart contract also, it helps in automating the, uh, the transactions. So because the smart contract is a self-executory agreement, right? So that removes third parties. So bringing about cost effectiveness and removing any long processing, right? So supply chain, I did say also, so this is one of the role that the blockchain uh, is uh, playing a very great uh important in the digital space. It helps with traceability. So you are able to trace. So that issue of supply chain management, you are able to manage product, you are able to trace product. And of course, uh, identity management. So it helps you because the blockchain, by virtue of that security, so you are able to uh, have a secured identity on the digital space and so help to stop get against uh, identity theft then intellectual property protection with, by the time they have any solution digitized on the blockchain system, that, you know, we said every entry on the blockchain is time stamped. So when uh, innovators enter their in inventions, 
on the blockchain platform. It will be time stamped. So when another person is coming later, maybe as a result of the bureaucracy or anything that is going on with the traditional system of registration, and he's not able to quickly do, he can actually converse the fact that he has entered this invention on the blockchain platform, which is time stamped, and will show that he was the first in time. So it will protect his ownership and then, of course, protect his right to this uh, platform. So these are the roles, the benefits that the blockchain is helping within the digital space. In the healthcare, I've made this explanation earlier in terms of uh, the fact that the secured information about health will be uh, when, once they deploy the uh, data of patients on the blockchain. It brings about a level of security and also brings about traceability that will be able to help to uh, provide information in terms of the health history of various clients. And then of course, it will not be leaked to unintended parties that will actually use that health information for the wrong use, right? And then of course, in terms of voting, we'll now have a secured form of voting system, right? So some of the regulations you want to look into, because of course, uh, there will be need for you to do uh, some research, with the assignment to be given to you, and then we'll discuss it on Twitter space on the 18th, right? So I would have spelled them out, but I decided to give you like this, so that it won't be that those that are not inclusive will be excluded, no. Uh, so laws around the electronic signatures, security laws, financial regulations, law, data privacy and protection laws like the EU GDPR, NDP, NDPR that I mentioned earlier, intellectual property uh, laws, laws around the consumer protection, and then of course anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism uh, uh, financing, right? So opportunities for lawyers, I have said it all earlier. So you help with regulatory compliance, smart contract development and review, you uh, uh, consult and advise, then of course help with uh, protecting the intellectual property. In dispute resolution, whether ADR or litigation, right? If you're into ADR, good and fine. If you have the knowledge of the blockchain, so when there's an issue within the ADR space or the mediation space, they will call on you. So because this is an emerging technology and a technology that has its own self-imposed rules that is different from any other thing that you have have known before in terms of the existing improved technology you when you sit on the board or on in the uh among the members of the people that are supposed to arbitrate upon uh a, a particular um a particular matter on the uh, blockchain uh issues you will definitely be able to show your expertise so because a lot of people are not in that space yet, so once they want to go for ADR, whether by way of arbitration, mediation, your exercise will be called for to come and, uh, you know, arbitrate or mediate in this matter. And if it's litigation, of course, like I said earlier, even in the in, during the welcome address, I did say that if they're having a dispute and they need to go to court, some of the issues that have been happening who do you who do you think will represent them? So the particular case is the Binance owner has been happening that uh, they were accused of uh, uh, of fraud, of evading tax, and several things. So you have to get to understand the technology to be. If it's the traditional lawyer they will bring, he will probably not be able to take into cognizance most of the features and uh, the things that uh, the blockchain has in place. And like I said, because of the regulatory, the uncertainty of the regulations around this, you know, some of the bad actors or people who started out not as bad actors but leveraging the fact that there's a loopholes in terms of existing laws not able to cater for this emerging nascent technology they are able to cut away with people's money but now various jurisdictions especially like nigeria and other countries are putting up uh uh their eyes on the space to be able to come up with laws and regulations that will help us guard uh, the space so that we'll be able to harness the opportunities that this emerging technology offers and at the same time protect the interests of investors and the consumers, right? And then at the same time also foster innovation. And so because you have this dilemma that the regulator, uh, regulators trying to see how they can balance uh, how they will protect investors, protect consumers, and then foster innovations and not stifling it, and then help to develop and build the, uh, the economic uh, system of the country. So, ladies, I believe I've not confused you, but been able to convince you to great level about the blockchain and its role. This is an introduction to the blockchain and its role in the digital economy. So, blockchain has the potential to revolutionize every industry law not excluded right and so it is very very important that you align yourself and like i said earlier it's predict predicted to be the major driver of the digital economy 
And don't forget that we are in an interconnected digital economy, right? And so I hope that uh, you understand your role in this space from this time that we have spent here today. And uh, you understand uh, the intersection between this and law and that it's not separate from what you have to do. And you don't have to think that, oh, are they taking me from the space of law? But this is something important that you should know and really get yourself interested in and commit always at this level i still i still read about it i still pay money i've been paying money to train for it i do free uh once i consume free information i consume paid one i like in this digital economy you just have to be committed to continuous learning and that's the way we can go about the whole thing so thank you ladies and uh we'll take few questions to be able to wrap up i can see that some uh persons uh already are living maybe due to other commitments all right over to you grace uh algebra thank you i could see that grace was already putting on the video to remind me right thank you uh, all right no, thank actually. you um, <laughs> thank that you. was a mistake thank you ma <laughs> thank you very much yeah. ma for thank a you. well researched presentation uh, it was very thorough you covered um, all the aspects that I know of an introduction to blockchain technology and I hope every one of us we all learned something today I'm sure by now all of us know what blockchain technology is um, it's a decentralized and distributed digital ledger system that records transactions across many computers in a way that the registered transactions cannot be altered. So um, as we have explained, I'm sure there will be no one here who say they don't know what blockchain technology is anymore. If you are confused about the definition, just think, what is a ledger? A ledger is a record book. And that's what blockchain technology is mostly for, is to record transactions. And we learned about the features of blockchain technology. Uh, we heard, up, we learned about the fact that it is decentralized as the number one feature. It is immutable. And another feature is transparency. And then um, and the third, the fourth feature is security. So I hope um, that the, um, most of, um, the discussion today was very clear, um, but for those who have questions, um, we are ready to answer and do justice to all the questions to make sure that no one here is left in the dark about what blockchain technology is. And in the course of, uh, of, of the program, you also be hearing about blockchain technology. So um, today will not be the only day that you will get to learn about blockchain technology. In the course of the program, you'll also be learning more about it. Um, I um, Unfortunately, I had some issues with my internet and I left for a while. And by the time I came back, a lot of the Q&A questions um, disappeared. So that's why I, I was very confused about a lot of things because um, so that I, um, Deborah is here. Um, she will help us with some of the questions that um, you guys have asked that are no longer available on, on my screen. So over to you, Deborah. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, as has been said, thank you very much, Ma. This was a very insightful um, session. So um, the first question I see here, are they in card love? What are the processes of deploying information on blockchain? Okay, thank you, uh, Adeyinka. Like I said, the blockchain, you know, it's not something you just sit to do alone. So part of the process is, is the fact that there will be a peer-to-peer, -peer, which is there will be a distributed network that have to be connected to this implementation. That's we're talking about you want to implement a blockchain solution now, right? There needs to be a, a, a network of of nodes, of computers, of people that will connect in a peer-to-peer -peer manner of this platform. There has to be uh, a, a, a consensus me uh, mechanism that will be used, right? Uh, means the language through which these connected nodes will agree upon the information that will be deployed to the platform. Right. And then, of course, there the needs to be uh, the fact that 
because it is distributed, you know that it's decentralized already. So there needs to be uh, these features of the peer-to-peer, -peer, the decentralization, the distribution. That's the distributed nature of it. And then a consensus mechanism. So these are some of the processes that helps to put in place the implementation of a blockchain system. So before you are talking about deploying something into the blockchain, you, there's already a network of connected nodes of people that will be uh, transacting within the network. And then, of course, there will be a consensus mechanism, the language with which they will use in agreeing and verifying the information. And then, of course, you know that the platform will be a decentralized one, right? So these are the things. Of course, you have to know that uh, there will be the immutability. So these features are the things that will determine the fact that you are deploying that information onto the platform. But it's not something, it's, as much as we say it's very is cost effective, to implement a blockchain solution is capital intensive. And that's why only one person cannot just do it unless you see like the big force or the big organizations that are building their private organizations. And that's why you have the public uh, blockchain that we made examples of things like the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hyperledger, where I said the Hyperledger have their open source, right? Uh, projects where you can actually come to that platform. So already some of the features are already put in place. So all you need to do if you're a developer or if you're interested in that technical aspect, you join the ecosystem. Yeah, I'm sure, of course, to join, you would have had the knowledge of what it takes to be able to get the various codes and the various uh, uh, things that will help you to log in. And then you are able to be a particular of the ecosystem. And then you build your solution, having in mind the features that the blockchain offers. And of course, to build a blockchain solution or implement or, or deploy anything to the blockchain, you have to really be sure because uh, whether those things will actually be, it will be advantageous to use blockchain to build that solution. So the purpose of you deploying a thing to the blockchain should not just be because you know blockchain is good. You must look at the features, the advantages of the blockchain. And if the problem that your business or your, your, your organization or your client is having, if it fits into the ones that aligns with the ones that blockchain can cater for because like i said if you take the issue of the immutability which is one of the features of the blockchain into being and you now deploy information uh that are not supposed to because you know that the blockchain you can't easily erase information on the platform and now you now go and deploy information that you cannot quickly erase that will go against the provisions of the data protection of your jurisdiction like in Nigeria here or within the provisions of the length of time for EU GDPR jurisdictions, then you'll probably be having an issue. So if you are a legal practitioner or a legal consultant in an organization and you're not able to take into cognizance what the provisions of the data privacy is to know the information they can deploy on chain and the information they should deploy off chain. If you're not able to advise a right and they now discover that they are going against compliance, then at the end of the day, I'm sure the work of such a legal professional will be done with, right? And then they will now have to rewrite and rebuild these solutions, which will not be funny to them. So I believe that has been able to answer your question. Yes, I hope um, that I believe that has answered the question of the um, person. So the next question, I'm just going to pick questions as random because of time. We have somebody that asks, please, can we have a copy of a blockchain sheet forwarded to the WhatsApp platform for a better understanding of it? A copy of what? The blockchain sheet. The blockchain sheet <laughs> forwarded to the <laughs> WhatsApp platform so we can have a better understanding. Okay, I, I really do not understand because like I told you, the blockchain is not something you will see, right? And like I, I said, unless you want me to do like the drawings I was doing in, in the way that the transactions of the blockchain are written in blocks. But of course, like what we have taught now will spoil you to do for that research. Don't even forget that you will still do research. We will be giving an assignment over the course of the weekend and then we'll be having a Twitter space on the 18th. So you have to go and read, 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 read. Okay, the presentation slide. Okay, that's what you, 
because I did start with the fact that blockchain, when I was using the uh, book analogy, I said this, of course, blockchain is not something you can hold, right? Okay, if it's the slide, of course, definitely, you will get the slide. You'll get it. Um, You'll get it. You'll get it. And then, uh, so... Yeah, I think I think if that's what you mean, uh, that should be it. But if that's not what you mean, please you could help me expatiate on that question for the person who asked the question, and then we can take it up from there. Thank you. We have so many questions, Ma. Please, how long wow. did you want us to? Um, yes, so many I, I saw one coming now. The series of of our courses. Yes, I I uh, we do. We do so maybe before the end of the program because I think we have uh, some master classes and bootcamp coming up next month. So I'm sure we'll share information about that one subsequently. So um, Deborah, please, uh, Grace or Deborah, who is uh, leading the question? Please go ahead. Okay. So um, since we ha still have some time, so um, okay, I'll just read this question. How is a blockchain network different from the internet? The internet is also a network of computers. It is decentralized and it is not owned by a single person. How is the blockchain network different from the internet? The, the internet, like, uh, you know, you don't use the internet. Thank you for the question, but you don't use the internet to enter information, right? The internet, like the broadband, uh, broadband right? Helps, it helps, it enables you to connect. Without the internet, we can't connect here, right? I talked about the possibility of okay, no, this one is different. I'm coming. Uh, Deborah will read them. So they are they they are different functions. So I do not think that you can get to your internet and be able to access internet and start in entering information. Like the internet enables you to perform transactions in the digital space, right? And so the uh, blockchain. Did you not hear from the explanation that the blockchain is a platform where it's a digital platform, a digital ledger, a database, basically, you enter information on the internet. It's not there's there's nothing like the internet that you can feel that you will say the internet is a computational calculation where you have to have a, uh, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer transacting uh, on the internet. Now you transact on the internet, you are, you are enabled, you are empowered to transact in the digital space upon a particular platform by the internet. I'm not sure if I tell you now, if you log out of the Zoom, you will tell me that, oh, I'm going to perform a transaction with the internet. No, but you are able to perform that transaction on a particular digital platform by the enablement of the internet. Right? I don't know whether I'm getting where you are going to. Or are you also talking to, like, uh, of course, it's not like the World Wide Web we are talking about, right? So, but if anything, please remember, like we have said, from the definition of the blockchain, which majorly we use the features of the blockchain, that the blockchain is uh, the entry of transactions in a time-stamped, immutable, efficient manner upon a platform that you know we're talking about immutability we're talking about entering a data or information or transactions into a place that is not changeable it's not easy to alter so i'm sure from that you can already get the answer that okay the internet is not uh you're not talking about uh it's not just decentralization the blockchain is not is not defined by just its decentralized features so if you recall the various features that makes up that blockchain, the decentralized nature, and of course, decentralized in what manner? If the internet you're saying is decentralized because everyone can access the internet from every jurisdiction. But like I said, the internet is not where you just enter information about what you are transacting about or data about, but it's just like an enablement, right? To be able to do this on a platform or on any of the digital uh, platform using any of the tools. So it's like the tool that enables you to be able to gain access to that blockchain. Because without the internet, you won't be able to perform that, right? Exactly. So I, I believe that answered the question. So if you if it's not if I'm not approaching it the way you expected, please kindly throw more lights on that question so I can expatiate for that. Thank you. Okay, Ma. So I believe that this will be the last question we'll be taking. Please, for every other person who has questions, um, kindly 
table in those questions in the evaluation form because I believe there is a part for you to write questions about the topics you do not understand. So um, yes, the apologies to those whose questions will not be answered. Then there's this question from Obodo Breta C. Please, Ma, is blockchain only related related to certain types slash parts of law? Please, because most of the scenarios you've mentioned are land cases. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, for the person that asked the questions, you know, when we are teaching, especially when you are uh, pressed for time, you're not going to use all the examples in the world. Even when you go to church or you go to mosque, I'm not sure they will use all the examples in the world. If not, you'll be constituting a nuisance and there will be the information overload. You're making use of several examples and nobody will know what to put in their mind, right? So th that's one of the simplest way and then one of the, uh, of course, like I said, when I came into this space, the first day I sat on that, uh, a blockchain seminar, that was the solution that came to my mind first. When we're talking about record entry, one of the, the biggest places that you have entry of record and tampering, that's the best scenario that I could have used, right? The land registry and the court registry. So it was to drive home the point but like I said, just like in the regulations, I told you that I only gave you the areas within which the laws are. In other slides I've done uh, for other presentations, I do spell, spell out some of those laws. But I said the uh, temptation is that sometimes people take it and, and make it like an exclusive thing that the ones you've not listed are not part of it. So now that's not the case here. So the, the examples are not intended to exclude other aspects. Don't forget that it's a nascent technology. It's an evolving one. It's, it is new. So we can only make use of the aspect where it has really found full expression and will help you to understand faster. Or, or would you rather, I also did made, made use of examples from the financial aspect, which is the first use case of the blockchain. Now, the major two use cases of the blockchain is the financial aspect and then, of course, uh, the cryptocurrency and the smart contract. So every other use cases that you have in terms of real estate, in terms of um, uh, uh, the insurance space, in terms of health, in terms of any industry where they have to deal with record entry, they all are enabled by use of the smart contract. And then you have the financial aspect. I did make use of the uh, finance earlier of the fact that okay the issues that were with the the monopoly the centralization and every other thing the fact that you are told when to get your money and not and then that brought about the first use case of the blockchain which was the uh, the cryptocurrency then the second use case was a smart contract it was the smart contract that now enabled every other aspect now for you and i what i want you to understand is not to be restricted not to see these things as restrictive it is to open you up to the possibilities and the fact that it is endless it's limitless there are great potentials about the blockchain that are not even yet known right so by the time you understand the basics and how it really applies to real world, there are issues. My intention is not just to feed you that this is where blockchain applies, is the land registry, no. But to use an example for you to get spot up, to know that there is so much possible with the blockchain. Let me go and sit as a team. Oh, they joined me to a group. Let me see how we can think of the solutions we can come up with. Yes, it might not be easy, but the fact still starts from the fact that you are opening your mind already. You understand it already. And then you are able to see the loopholes, the gaps where the blockchain with its features and advantages can be that you think and you know very well it aligns properly with the fact that this blockchain can be a solution to that space. And as a lawyer, you're not restricted. All you need is to know with one example or two examples that will open you up to uh, further research and then to be open-minded to further trainings, right? As a lawyer, you're not restricted in the sense that because blockchain applies, there are use cases within the health sector. Are you telling me that lawyers are not working within the health sectors? Lawyers are serving as advisories from your role as a lawyer, I did tell you. So what other example will I do? I made use of the health sector whereby, of course, if you're a lawyer who is relating or who is advising or consulting for the health uh, care, you want to actually know uh, that they are in compliance with uh, the provisions of the law, whether the health sector or any other sector. Because, of course, for the health sector, they'll be dealing with a lot of records, record keeping and record entry, data entry for their patients. 
And I did mention the fact that you don't want the information to be leaked to unintended persons. So by virtue of the security of the blockchain, most people are building uh, solutions within the health sector on the blockchain already. And then, of course, if the health sector also are ready to come, are uh, able to come together as a consortium, just like the JP Morgan Forum uh, have that uh, consumption blockchain, the forum, uh, whereby a group of organizations within the same industry will see some areas of alignment and want to share data, will build that consumption blockchain to be able to gain access and help each other with seamless operation to information within that industry that will help them, right? So these are examples uh, to what we can do. And I did mention also in the advanced level or intermediate level of blockchain training, you get to understand tokenization where we are tokenizing real life assets. That still boils down in terms of awarding real life uh, uh, digital values to uh, real life properties. And one of it is the block, uh, the real estate, which I have made mention of the, uh, the landed properties or the land registry Registry, where I made use of the fact that land barriers already uh, for years uh, had their own uh, land registry deployed on the blockchain, right? So I, I think there are good examples already, but no, they are not just the only examples that can actually happen. The insurance space. So as long as you are dealing with record entry, data entry, you definitely will play your role as a lawyer because you will talk about compliance, if not compliance in terms of uh, regulations, the provisions of law in terms of uh, tax law, in terms of uh, data protection, whether they are within EU GDP, uh, our jurisdiction, whether they are within your own jurisdiction or outside jurisdiction. You want to know within the space that your client is uh, operating and harnessing this data. Of course, uh, we, we, we know the, uh, the the fact that issues around data privacy are of great importance now. And then, of course, uh, the, I've mentioned the health uh, industry, right? So any industry that you actually know that uh, when you understand the basics, like from the advantages and features, like I said, it's not all solutions that will probably need the blockchain. Because some, you will deploy them to the blockchain, they will be contradicting the provisions of the law, so much so something like the data protection laws. And I mentioned the fact that you want to be sure that information that will be deployed on chain because the blockchain works with immutability that makes it hard to alter information, you will be able to advise correctly to know the information that will go on-chain and the one that will be off-chain uh, so that they don't breach provisions of some of these uh, legal uh, deregulations. And that's not just it. It's also to help you understand the fact that even as a lawyer, your role does not have to end with just advisory, uh, helping with compliance, helping with uh, uh, drafting of uh, smart contract review and development or programming of a smart contract, if you want to get into the technicalities, and every other role that I have mentioned, you can actually understand this and in the long run, be a partaker of the creators of the innovations that will tackle real life solutions. I mentioned that. So those are examples. So there are solutions that are probably uh, to come that only you can also sit and understand that, oh, this kind of problem, because I sat that day, I wasn't told an example about land registry and the court registry before I knew that they were use cases. The person who taught the class, the first class I sat for blockchain then was not a lawyer. So he was just mentioning immutability. And when he explained immutability, he didn't mention anything about law because he's not into law. So the regular blockchain training you will see will not just bring law and try to help you connect it this way. I I I went through those research to be able to build my own. Yes, now we can have some of those kind of teachings around other places. But when I started in this space at the time, I didn't see that. So when he mentioned immutability, then I recall that it wasn't long that I had the issue with the allergy for my clients that they extorted or extracted this C of O from the land registry. So, of course, you might not, some of you are not called yet, and some are already lawyers and all that, but you will have an idea on what that pro uh, on property transactions will be. So that's like the simplest and the easiest example that you can really, that can help you to really get this uh, information. And then is it in terms of the cryptocurrency transactions, facilitating a uh, transfer of uh, cryptocurrency? I briefly made mention of that one on the fact that if you are transferring five Bitcoin, they want to be sure the miners will have to confirm that you have that number of Bitcoin and that you are the owner and you have it actually in your wallet and you want to transfer it. They will verify it and then they will be able to 
uh, then you'll be able to continue with your transactions and then it will be taken to the other person's wallet and the, the person will have to transfer the money whether through the peer-to-peer -peer platform where they will pay like, like we were doing in Nigeria the peer-to-peer -peer platform where they will now send to your uh, uh, account of of the blockchain platform and then you have to come back to verify on like the Binance platform when Binance uh, was not fined and they has not taken it out of their platform at that time so these are a Examples and then these are just the beginning of the limitless opportunities that are in the blockchain space. So it's not just land registry, it's not just court registry. Uh, so uh, I'm open to discuss more uh, with whoever asks the question and whoever is interested for that. And then, of course, in further training that you get. But once you have the basic understanding and basic example that is helping you to understand, the sky is just the beginning. So you don't need 1,001 examples before you catch the fire, but the examples that will actually help you to understand how the chain of title, the chain of events, of records can be broken and the connected nodes can be triggered to know that, oh, somebody has done. So that document that the allergy took, if it was on the blockchain, at the time they ex extracted it from the land registry, the connected nodes, other participants will be triggered to know that somebody has taken an information or is bringing an information or is trying to break into the block, one of the blocks to take the information out, right? Thank you. Thank you very okay. much, Ma. Yeah, yeah we'll, thank you. We hand it over to Grace now to um, conclude the session. All right, thank you. Okay, well, it's apparent that um, Grace is not, um, Grace might be having network issues right now. Uh, please let's all flood the chat box with thank you messages. Thank you so much, Ma, for this insightful session. Thank yeah, you so, thank so you. much, Ma. Thank you so much, Thank Ma. you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So for every one of you that have your questions that were not attended to, we're sorry we've gone past uh, quite a long time. From 300 and something, you can see that we're now remaining like 150, right? So please, in the uh, form for today, fill in, uh, put in your questions, and then the day of the Twitter space on the 18th will be a free day where we'll have a Twitter space. Do your research for that. We'll probably share like uh, maybe a topic for you to be able to um, uh, uh, work on. And then, of course, most of you will be speakers during the session also. Uh, Deborah and uh, Grace will convey further information to you about that, right? And then, of course, we'll be able to also have that discussion on the Twitter space and those questions, we can bring them up there. I can address it and even other persons that have greater, uh, you know, contributions to it. Let's come there and share this knowledge and put ourselves out there to know that we're committed to learning uh, major important technologies like this and that we're aligning ourselves uh for the digital uh the global uh space as women in the legal space right so thank you uh deborah thank you uh yes, grace i guess that will be all for me so you share the link the various things have you announced for those that will be interested on in the certificates to uh, indicate yes, early enough so we don't yes, have uh, issues of people rushing us at the end and all that. Please share your lessons, tag me, tag the firm. And uh, yeah, that's over, over to you, Deborah. Thank you. Okay, Ma. Um, is Grace available now? Yes, um, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, I'll hand over now. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for all your contributions, especially you guys are stayed to the very end. Um, I pray that your reward uh, will not be lost. And I still want to encourage all of you. Um, I know some of you may have had difficulties with understanding what was discussed today. And I remember yesterday I suggested that um, before coming for the lecture, you should um, do a small research on the topic so that you can easily follow along. And I suggested that um, if you don't know um, where to begin to do your research, because if you go type on Google, Google can um, um, 
Google can uh, take you to many web, um, articles and websites and you may just spend too much time. Just go on chat GPT and um, type in a prompt that says that you have a lecture on the topic so, so, and so. Can you please give me a brief summary of this topic and chat GPT will be able to help you with that. So um, this would really help you to follow along because in the course of this program, you are going to be encountering some words and topics that you probably have never heard of before. So preparation before the lecture would definitely help you to follow up more. So I really thank you all for, um, uh, thank you for staying till this time and thank you for your patience. And tomorrow show up early to come in early for the lectures also helps because um, if you come in the middle of the lecture, you may end up um, being lost half of the lecture. So um, come early, do, do some research beforehand, pay attention and always take notes so that you are not, um, so that you, because so that you don't forget everything that you are learning. And ask questions too. Like we said yesterday, be bold, be confident, ask questions. So thank you very much, Mrs. Debrowney. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you to all our volunteers that helped to make this program a huge success. And we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ladies. Uh, do have a great day. So we say on Monday, we'll be having um, one of my colleagues coming to take us on compliance around the tech-driven world, right? So the flyer will be shared within the uh, weekend so you can prepare uh, appropriately for it. At the same time, uh, 12 to one thirty. yes. So Stephen Azubike will be coming to take us on a session on that day. So let's prepare, right? And then... Um, do further research and further reading on this. And Deborah and Grace will share the link for the certificate on the group, or probably I believe it's pinned on your platform. Uh, so you can check that. Go share your lessons and let others learn. Thank you. Thank you. You're all welcome. God bless you all. I appreciate you, Deborah. I appreciate you, Grace. Thank you for your time and your commitment to service. And I ask that God reward you abundantly. Thank you so much for being a part of this and uh, helping to bring okay. this to pass seamlessly. God bless you all. Thank you, amazing ladies. Do enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy your weekend until we see again on Monday. But uh, for that communication, will be done on the platform. My team here, amazing. Ladies, thank you so much. God bless you. Bye.